Hi, I'm Art Bergeron, and welcome to this seminar on Elder Law for Singles. If you haven't seen these presentations before, uh, I am an Elder Law attorney. I do nothing but Elder Law, and I work at Myrick O'Connell. Uh, this presentation today is really about um, Mary. Remember, in the many seminars that you've probably seen of mine, you, I always talk about Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. We're going to talk a lot about Mary today. So, you know, one of the issues with your estate planning is that it changes over time. And, and, and for example, I think um, in a previous presentation, I talked about Frank and Mary during their lifetimes as they got older and how their um, estate planning really needed to change for the benefit of themselves and for the benefit of their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Um, but in this presentation, we're assuming that Frank has died. And, you know, he, I don't know where he went. Maybe he, maybe he went to heaven. Uh, maybe he didn't. But the point is that he is now dead. And so Mary is trying to figure out whether her estate planning needs to change. Uh, or more likely, Mary didn't, isn't thinking about this because everything was kind of uh, named her and her husband. Everything was kind of going along. Then Frank died. Maybe, maybe Mary has not then changed her estate planning documents. That's one of the things we want to talk about today. So what does she need to change? We're assuming that Mary is 70 years old. Um, there are two documents that she probably needs to change right away. Um, first, her health care proxy, because that health care proxy, which governs what happens if she's incapacitated and it gives somebody uh, the power to make medical decisions, uh, I would bet that health care proxy named Frank in that case so she probably needs to do a new one. So as a quick refresher for a healthcare proxy, you need two witnesses. Uh, the only uh, issue is that a witness cannot also be the agent that you're naming in the proxy. Uh, it's only effective when you become incapacitated. So until then, you're totally in control of your medical decisions. If a doctor says you're incapacitated, um, even, even for a short time, the healthcare proxy agent kicks in and the doctor talks to the agent about how you want to be cared for. You can only name one agent at a time, uh, and the execution of a new healthcare proxy always invalidates the old one, so you don't have to revoke the old healthcare proxy. Uh, so the questions for Mary are really, um, <clears throat> first of all, who is your agent, and does she want to name one of her kids uh, initially, and then a backup alternate agent, and then where is the healthcare proxy? Because it's no good if it's, I have several cases where I've talked to folks, and the healthcare proxy is in their, their like strong box. You know, or it's in the, the safe deposit box at the bank. No, it doesn't help anybody. So you need to have your proxy uh, be with your doctor. Next time you go in for, to, for uh, your, check, your annual checkup, you should talk to your doctor, have them file that healthcare proxy, uh, get it scanned in so that wherever you are, if you end up in a hospital uh, or with another doctor, your, your doctor can, can simply email that healthcare proxy. Um, uh, having it on file with the hospital, in some communities that is useful if the hospital will take them. In many hospitals they won't because they will only accept a healthcare proxy if you're about to sign in, either in the emergency room or otherwise. So the, the best place to have the healthcare proxy is with your doctor. You would very least want to give a healthcare copy of that proxy to the person you're naming in the proxy. I've had many cases where people do these healthcare proxies don't even tell the person that they've named that they want that person as their proxy. At this point, Mary should also probably have a conversation with that person about how she does want to be taken care of in the event that she were incapacitated. Second document she really has to have is a power of attorney. She probably wants to change it now in order to make sure that if she's incapacitated, there's somebody who can handle her financial affairs, go to the bank, go to the insurance company, deal with all of her different things. So, Power of attorney, no witnesses required, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't have to be notarized, but should be only because um, while legally you don't need it, many people who see a power of attorney will not think it's valid unless there's a notary. I've encountered that a lot. So you just save yourself a lot of trouble and more importantly, save the person you're naming a lot of trouble um, if, you, if you have the proxy notarized. Finally, a fi signing a new one does not revoke an old health care or an old power of attorney. So if you're doing this new power of attorney, naming one of your kids, you can also name more than one of your kids. Uh, as opposed to the health care proxy, regarding the power of attorney, you can name two of your kids or three jointly and severally 
What that means is that any one of them could act on your behalf if the other were not around. Um, but the main thing to remember about the power of attorney is executing a new one doesn't revoke an old one. So if you were actually trying to eliminate someone as your, as your power of attorney, or you know that power of attorney has been filed in banks or other places, uh, what you probably want to do is, is sign a revocation of the old power of attorney and file it in those other places, like at the bank. Um, finally, uh, provisions in the power of attorney. If you have a house, you want to make sure that your attorney has the ability to sign documents for you. Uh, and that needs to be in the power of attorney. If you're giving the power of attorney agent the ability to make gifts, either to himself or herself uh, or to others, then that needs to be in the power of attorney. Uh, if you want to give, if you want to give, have that power of attorney have the power to give away your assets so that you can avoid estate, estate tax at the time of your death, we'll talk about this a little bit later on, uh, then you want to make sure there are no caps on the amount that your, your power of attorney agent can give. Uh, so the main thing is you want to you check those documents out. Uh, the next thing that Mary probably really wants to do is to deal with how her estate plan is, is, um, is going to be carried out, since chances are her estate planning documents, like her will and her trusts, all specify that when she dies, things go to Frank. So she may want to change that, or she may want to relook at this. So for most of the estate plans that I do, uh, if I'm dealing with a single person who has children, they'll tell me, oh, when, when I die, my estate plan is very simple. They'll inevitably say, oh, I just need a simple will. When I die, I want things to be divided equally among my kids. And that's fine, but uh, what I would suggest to Mary at this point is this is a good time to be looking at whether that's really what exactly what you want. For example, do your children have any particular problems? Are there creditor issues? Do any of the kids have problems with creditors? Does any of the, do any of the kids have, have, have marriage issues where you may have a concern that if you died, um, um, that after that the other the spouse may be filing for divorce, in which case maybe you don't want those assets that your, your child just inherited to be part of the estate that the probate judge is considering in divorce. Finally, does anyone have a disability? You don't want to be leaving assets to kids um, who are really having problems. Certainly that's the case if they have a cognitive dis disability, if they're already on mass health or on other, other government programs, but you may also want to consider this issue um, in, in the event that, that one of your kids has a uh, opioid issue. Do they have a drug issue? Do they have a, another substance abuse issue? Is there a reason why, are they just terrible with money? Is there a reason why you want to figure out where those assets might be going and instead of giving them directly to the child, be putting them in trust for the benefit of that child? That brings up other issues. Who should the trustee be? Where would the assets go following that, trust, that, that, that child's death? But there are a number of issues that you may want to consider. The next thing that Mary would typically be talking about, either because she heard her friends talking about it or because her, her kids were talking about it, was trying to structure things so that she could avoid the probate process. Uh, if you, and, and the first question really is, well, what is probate? Because, you know, a lot of folks will tell me, well, you know, I really need a trust, I really need to do this or that in order to avoid probate, but they're not sure of exactly what probate is. Well, the point of probate is probate is there to deal with who gets the assets that you die owning in just your individual name if you haven't named a death beneficiary. The question is, um, who gets what? Um, but also, the, the other piece about probate is if assets are going through the probate process, before they can be distributed to anyone, um, creditors have to get paid. Creditors have one year from the day of your death to file a claim against the probate estate. Therefore, probate always takes at least a year and a day. Um, so to the extent that you want to avoid probate, you want to avoid um, having that delay, which is going to keep assets from getting distributed to your kids. I'm just going to mention one other thing, a car. Um, assets are, are never presumed to be owned by somebody other than yourself, except in the case of a car. If you own a car and it was held jointly with somebody else and that was your spouse, then presumptively 
the moment you die, your spouse becomes the owner of the car. So the surviving spouse can literally just go to the registry of deeds um, with a death certificate, uh, sign something called a marriage affidavit saying that they were the surviving spouse and the registry will then put the car into your name. That's no longer the case though if your spouse has died. In that case, the car will, in, the, the ownership of a car at the time of death will inevitably cause a probate. So you want to be kind of dealing with that asset, asset specifically. I'm going to mention a way to deal with that a little bit later on. Wills do not avoid probate. As I said, the probate process is designed to figure out who gets what when you die. If you die leaving a will, then you file that will with the probate court. And at the time, and after that one year has expired, the assets get distributed according to the terms of the will. If you have no will, then after the one year has expired, the assets get distributed according to something called the rules of intestacy. That is, the rules that apply when there is no will. In either case, though, in either case, you have to go through probate. So having a will does not avoid probate. So the question is, um, how do you avoid it? Because if you, if you go through probate, as I mentioned, there's this one year delay. There are also, of course, the legal costs, which typically tend to be around between three and $10,000, depending on what the assets are that, in, that are involved, whether anybody is contesting anything. There are a bunch of other issues, but the point is, it's money that, that you're gonna have to, will have to be spent by your kids if you haven't figured out how to avoid probate. So assume that these are, are Mary's assets, that she has a home worth about $350,000. She has savings of 250, she has an IRA worth 400,000, and she has a, an, an annuity. Now assuming that, the, that the annuity, in the annuity she's named a death beneficiary, and that she's named the death beneficiary in the IRA and the 401k, those assets will not run through probate. I wanna mention though, remember, as far as Mary is concerned, she's probably named Frank as the death beneficiary. Um, and, and when Frank died, if she hasn't named alternate beneficiaries on those IRA or 401k forms, those assets are gonna to have to go through probate. So Mary's gonna, if, if that's your situation, you wanna make sure you check with whoever is managing the IRA or the 401k to make sure that, that you've named death, new death beneficiaries. Regarding the savings account and regarding the home though, those are accounts that she probably just owned with Frank. Uh, and if she dies, the question then is, does she wanna change that to specify that the kids are the named death beneficiaries, right? And, and possibly she could do that. Regarding the house, that's not uh, uh, really uh, so much of an option. So she's really going to need, regarding the house, she's gonna to need to do something to deal with probate. Um, mechanisms to avoid probate. Well, one is joint ownership. As I was just mentioning, if you own something jointly with someone, legally, the moment that you die, that pr your interest in that um, property evaporates. The surviving joint owner becomes the sole owner of the property. In Frank and Mary's case, that's probably why when Frank died, no probate was necessary. They probably owned everything jointly. Um, if, if Mary now wants to have that same thing happen, she could certainly name her kids, for example, as joint owners on the accounts that she has. Legally, that means that when she dies, one or more of the kids would become the joint owners. Um, she, Mary should also be aware, though, if she does that during her lifetime and one of the children gets sued, those assets can then be attached because legally, each asset is 100% owned by all of the joint owners. Also, she should understand that while she is alive, that means that her children, as the joint owners, any one of them, could go in and take all of the money out of the account. An alternative to that, if Mary has bank accounts where she wants to keep control, but to leave specific people those assets when she dies, would be to go to the bank and have a so-called TOD uh, account or a POD account set up, an account that specifies that following her death, those assets will go to a specific person. Um, uh, many, many people uh, handle their U.S. savings bonds that way so that the U.S. savings bonds don't inadvertently trigger a probate. Finally, there is the trust. Um, Mary, if she wanted to keep control of all of her assets, could certainly create a revocable and amendable trust. A revocable trust means whatever you've put into it, you can take out of it. 
Amendable would mean, as the name suggests, that she can amend the trust anytime um, while she is alive. In the trust, she would specify that following her death, somebody, uh, one of the children, a third party, whoever she wants, could step in as the successor trustee and distribute all assets at that time. If she structured things that way, then none of the assets that are in trust will end up needing to go through the probate process, but she'll be keeping control of the assets for the rest of her life. Another alternative that Mary could, deal, could use is simply last minute giving. Um, and for reason, also for estate um, tax avoidance reasons, there may be a reason why Mary wants to structure things so that they get given away, at least, even if she's not giving them away during her healthy lifetime, that they given away, get given away before she dies. Um, one um, especially important asset for, for which she may want to deal with it, which she may want to deal with that way, would be the car. Uh, if she has the title to the car and she's named someone as her power of attorney agent, she may want to tell that child, look, I need the car now. I want to keep the car in my name. I may want to sell it later on. Who knows? But if I start getting sick, or, or, or if not if I just start getting sick, but if I'm getting sick and it looks like I may die soon, what I'd like you to do is take the title, take your power of attorney, go to the registry, transfer the car into your own name. You're at the registry, you can sign all the documents right there and the car can get transferred into your name. Then you may tell your child, either keep the car or at that point, I'd like you to transfer the car to so-and-so, to one of the grandchildren, to whoever. If Mary has, has dealt with that and the, and the title then gets signed uh, and, the and, and the title transferred before she dies, that car will not cause an inadvertent probate. <clears throat> Remember, regarding trusts, the trust is revocable and amendable, so she can cancel it at any time. There are no negative tax implications to that trust, so for tax purposes, this is a so-called grantor taxable trust. For tax purposes, it's as if she still owns those assets. Uh, she uses her own tax ID number on all of these trusts, she doesn't file any addition, additional tax returns. Uh, and once again, the advantage of structuring things this way is there is instant distribution after death. Also, as I mentioned, creditors have claims against the probate assets. Creditors will not have claims after her death regarding the assets that are in this, this revocable trust. So that to the extent she's concerned about creditor claims, this is another handy way of dealing with it. Um, estate tax minimization. While Frank and Mary were alive, they really weren't concerned as much about estate tax minimization since any assets that are given to the surviving spouse are subtracted from the taxable estate. If Mary is single though, and now owns all of these assets, then she should be aware that under Massachusetts law, the Massachusetts estate tax will impose an estate tax on any taxable estate of more than a million dollars. In the example that we're giving, Mary's estate is $1.2 million. Now, to, to get a sense of the, the order of magnitude of what the tax might be, I just wanted to give you, to show you how that tax gets computed. In Massachusetts, there are two uh, alternative ways of computing the tax, and the way that the estate will, will, com will, the, or will compute the tax and the tax that will be paid will be by computing the tax using the two different methods and then paying the tax, the lower of the two compu computed tax results. Um, the first way is you, that if, if Mary had died, the, the, the folks administering the estate would use this estate tax chart. This is a chart that got developed at this point almost 100 years ago. Um, and at the time that it was developed, it was developed when the estate tax was created. Um, and at that time, if you died having assets of more than $40,000, you were considered to have a lot of money. I know that's hard to believe right now, but for that reason, uh, the Massachusetts estate tax starts imposing a tax if your assets are more than a million dollars. It impose, in, uh, excuse, excuse me, starts imposing the tax if your assets are more than $40,000. So the tax starts getting imposed really early according to the old chart. According to that chart, if you had an estate of a million dollars, your estate tax would be $36,560. In Mary's case, with an estate of a million two hundred thousand dollars, her estate tax would be $49,040. Um, many people haven't even heard of this chart 
They just know in their minds that a Massachusetts estate tax does not get imposed until you have an estate of more than a million dollars. That's the alternative estate tax computation. Uh, many years ago, it was determined that it really seemed to be unfair that folks um, who had these really small estates were paying an estate tax. Therefore, what the legislature did is they increased the, the minimum estate that would be subject to taxation to 100,000 and then to 500,000 and ultimately to a million dollars. And so, but, but then that benefit, that estate tax benefit disappears um, after you get to an estate that is over a million dollars, but it, it disappears this way. If you have an estate that has a million dollars or less in it, then you pay zero in estate tax. If you are, are over that amount, then you pay 40% of all of the dollars that are over $1 million. So if you have a, a, a taxable estate of, of a million and one dollars, you have an estate tax of 40 cents. If you have an estate of a million one hundred thousand dollars, you have an estate tax of forty thousand dollars, which would still be less than the estate tax that would be would, that would be that would be charged using the the uh, the the uh, the chart. Uh, once you get over about a million one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. This number, the 40% of all the dollars over a million, becomes greater than the number using a, the chart. So basically, this estate tax exemption disappears. The point is, there's going to be an estate tax when Mary dies, unless she does something. The thing that she can do to easily avoid the estate tax is give assets away. She can give away any amount of assets that she wants before she dies. There is no Massachusetts estate tax. There are some disadvantages to giving away certain assets like the home, uh, and also like any tax deferred funds. So she should talk to her estate, plan her estate planning lawyer and her accountant about this. But the point is, she can avoid the estate tax by simply giving money away. Finally, let's pretend that Mary is 80 years old instead of 70 and that she has a million two in assets. One of her concerns is asset protection in the event that she needs to go to a nursing home. Because if she does have to go to a nursing home, the private pay cost of that nursing home is going to be probably higher than, at this point, $14,000 a month. Her, her, her monthly income, you may recall, is only from Social Security and it's $2,000 a month, which means if she's in the nursing home, she's paying $12,000 a month or $144,000 a year, uh, unless she can qualify for Mass Health. She may want to try to plan to qualify for Mass Health. The only way to do that, though, after, she has, after Frank has died, is to give her assets away and to wait five years. So the question is, is there someone she trusts to whom she can give these assets? Um, and does this really bother her? What keeps her up at night more? The notion that she doesn't have control of these assets or the notion that if she needs nursing home care, she, all these assets are going to have to get spent down in order to qualify for mass health. That's the question. So. If she wants to protect these assets, she needs to give them away and wait five years. She can simply give them away to her children if she wants. Uh, regarding the house, what she probably wants to do is to give away a so-called life, a so-called remainder interest in the house. That is the interest in the house that ends um, or that starts at the moment of her death, and keep a life estate. That is the interest in the house that ends at the moment of her death. Five years after she's done that, this asset will no longer be countable or lienable. There are pluses to this approach. It avoids probate, among other things. She still keeps the fact that when she dies, there'll be a step up in the tax basis of the house, so the kids won't pay any capital gains tax. And as I mentioned, five years after she's done this, uh, that remainder interest will no longer be countable or lienable. The disadvantages, if the kids go to sell the house, if she needs to sell the house while she's alive, there will be a capital gains tax. She'll need her kids' consents, and the kids may be having financial problems of their own at that point. If she wants to avoid that, then she may want to consider creating an irrevocable trust. The irrevocable trust would typically name her most trusted child as the trustee, would specify that while she's alive, these assets can be given to her children so that it, because she trusts the child that she's naming as the trustee, the child could then give the assets to himself or herself and give the assets to her. But the trust would specify that, that there are no loans that could get back to her and that there's no way of amending that trust. If she does that, then by doing that, she could protect those assets. So 
I hope you um, uh, enjoyed this program. I know we covered a lot of material, as I've mentioned over and over. The goal of, of estate planning is to sleep well at night. Uh, if you want to talk about any of these issues, I urge you to just email me or, uh, or uh, give me a call at 508-860-1470. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next month.